Oh. Um, I'd like to start off with a chant that I learned from a Tibetan lama, or from a lama who is uh, actually is not Tibetan, he is Western, but was trained in the Tibetan tradition. And it's uh, a chant to Padmasambhava, who historically was the uh, master who brought uh, Tantric Buddhism to Tibet. The way that I was taught, Padmasambhava here is um, two things, you could say, well, three things. He's the person, the historical person, but he's also the accumulation of every teacher that you've ever had, anyone who has pointed you to your own nature mm. and who you've benefited from. Mm. So it's an invocation to all of them. So by chanting that, we are invoking all of their presences. And it's also, Padmasambhava is uh, the name for a cosmic principle, which is consciousness's capacity to lead, to teach. So by doing this, we are calling on our inner resource so that teaching will happen for you uniquely. You'll hear exactly what you need to hear and it won't be coming necessarily from here. It may come from other people speaking. It may come from a gurgling in your stomach or feeling in the back of your neck or who knows. But we're invoking the field of teaching for all of us so that it's happening through the whole situation. And all there is to do is listen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I'd like to start with an exercise if you if you feel moved to participate. So, uh, let's see. So the the purpose of this exercise is um, to um, clarify subject from object, so-called subject from so-called object. So, to discriminate between that which changes and which doesn't. Mm -hmm. So these, these are, you know, usually called keys, and there's a way in which you aren't separate from these. There's a way in which there's a continuity, or a continuum between you and these keys. And we know about that, at least maybe just even conceptually. But uh, for the purpose of this exercise, we're talking about the way in which you aren't these keys. So you're aware of these keys, are you not? In that case, just for the sake of this exercise, or for the sake for now, these are the object, you're the subject, therefore you're not the keys. We're exploring the way in which you're not the keys. This is the way in which you are the keys. We're exploring the way in which you're not. Just for the sake of this. <coughs> to distinguish. Very good. So, um, when you're ready, if you can just close your eyes. <coughs> and just get comfortable. If you want to have your eyes open with a soft gaze, that's fine too. Just notice your breathing and the sensation of your breathing. Just noticing our breathing and the sensation of our breathing. <laughs> You're aware of the sensation of your breathing, are you not? So in that sense, the sensation of your breathing is an object to you. You are aware of it. You're the subject, it's the object, and you're not your breathing. So exploring the way in which you're not your breathing, you're aware of your breathing. Allow yourself to bring into your awareness the sensation of your upper body as well as the sensation of your breathing. Everything from your belt line up. All of those sensations. You're aware of those, are you not? Do you have a sense of the sensations of your upper body? Very good. So the sense of your upper body, the sensations of your upper body are an object to you. You're the subject. They are the object. And now allow yourself to put, include the sensations of your lower body. sensations of the body, sensations of the breathing. These are an object to you. You are aware of them. So in that sense, the sensations of the body are not you. You are aware of them. Now, whatever feeling sense you have around your body, maybe you feel an energy field, some sensations around you. 
maybe you feel the energy of the people in the room, the presence of all of us here together. Whatever sensations you have of the presence of the room, you're aware of this, are you not? In that sense, all of the sense of presence, including the presence of your body, presence of your breathing, all of the sensations are an object to you. You are aware of them. They aren't you. So include every sensation that you feel subtle, all of it. That's your experience right now. I don't know what that is. You do all of the experience of sensation that you feel now. I guess it's called kinesthetic field, the entire kinesthetic field. You're aware of it, are you not? You have a sense of it. So in that way, it's an, it's an object to you. You are aware of it. In that sense, you're the subject, it's the object. It is in you. And now, and you also hear my voice and the sound of the cars. Maybe your own breathing. Sounds in the room. Maybe some high-pitched noises inner ear noises, subtle vibration, static. You're aware of all of this field of sound, are you not? So in that sense, this whole field of sound, the auditory field, as well as the whole field of sensation, kinesthetic field, You are aware of them. They are objects to you. You're not them. You are the subject, they are the objects. And maybe there's some light on the back of your eyelids. Kind of <coughs> geometric patterns or just scattered light, diffuse light. Just let yourself be aware of the whole visual field. And just notice that you are aware of the visual field. You have a sense of it, don't you? A sense of the visual field. You are aware of it. So in that way, you are the subject aware of the visual field. And it's an object to you. You are. auditory view, <coughs> kinesthetic view. Maybe you have some taste from breakfast in your mouth, or maybe the coffee, or just a neutral taste in your mouth, whatever that taste is there, and maybe some smells. So you're aware of the gustatory, olfactory view, are you not? sense fields, kinesthetic, auditory, visual, gustatory, olfactory. You are aware of them, and you aren't them. You're the awareness of them. You're the subject, you're the objects. And maybe as I'm speaking, there's some emotions there, maybe relaxation, maybe curiosity, maybe frustration, maybe boredom, or whatever emotions you're feeling, they may change moment to moment. You're aware of those emotions, are you not? You have a sense of them. You are aware of them, 
You are the subject. They are objects to you. An object. Right now. But you're you. So in that sense, your emotions are an object to you. They aren't you. You are aware of them. And as we're doing this here, undoubtedly, unless you're very, very unique, you might have had a thought or two while this has been happening. You're aware of those thoughts, are you not? So in that sense, those thoughts are an object to you. We can call them the field of mind or the field of thinking. You're aware, aware of this field, are you not? You are aware of it. Therefore, you aren't your thoughts. Your thoughts are objects here to subject. Get a sense of this. Now, you might have a feeling like me. Not everybody feels that they have a feeling like me, but most of us do, many of us do. A feeling sense that feels like you. Like if someone says your name, you feel something like it. If you say your name to yourself, you're aware of this meanness, are you not? You are aware of it. Therefore, it is an object to you. You're the subject aware of it, the object. So in that sense, the feeling of meanness isn't to you. You're aware of it. And as I've been speaking, uh, I said, you know, becoming aware of your lower half of your body, your upper half of your body, you've been moving around your attention. Do you have a sense of that? Your attention? You're aware of your attention, are you not? So in that sense, the attention isn't you. You're aware of the attention. You're the subject. The attention is an object to you. So, as I've been saying this, there's been something like a very, very subtle form of mind. We could call it the chooser, or we could call it the noticer, or discrimination is the sophisticated word for it. The noticer. So I've been saying, you are aware of this. And there's been a little piece in the, it's not even, maybe even any discursive thought there, just going, uh huh, you are aware of that, uh huh, and this is that, uh huh. That is that, uh -huh. it's like a little checker. That discriminator. You're aware of that discriminator, are you not? You're aware of that chooser, are you not? So, this chooser, this discriminator, this noticer, is an object to you. You are aware of it. So you are not the noticer. You're aware of the noticer. You are the subject, it is the object. So see if you can get a sense of the subject. What's aware of the noticer? So maybe you have a subtle object some folks, spaciousness, vastness, peace, whatever it is, just notice it's an object to you. You're aware of that peace, that emptiness, that spaciousness, that... So in that sense, it's an object to you. See if you can get a sense of what's aware of the spaciousness, vastness, Empty. Anyone have a sense of what's aware of this? If you do and you feel like it's you can just raise your hand. So maybe we can open our eyes for a moment. 
So I know that, so forgive me if this is uh, baby steps. I think everyone here is seasoned, so we, we already all know this. Um, is there, anyone have a sense of the subject? So, no sense of the subject. Every time when we, even an emptiness, okay, well, what's aware of emptiness? Oh, spaciousness. What's aware of spaciousness? Ah, it's a great piece. So we all have, you know, students or clients or whoever we're working with. Peace, yes, it's okay. So what is aware of the peace? So we get to this point, and many, many students of mine get to this point, and I call it the glass ceiling because they go, well, is this thing like, well, I can't get out of that loop. There's always something. There it is. I'm bumping my head against the glass ceiling there. There's just, I can't. And it's like, yes, perfect. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So what that is is actually the true, the discriminator, the noticer, noticing that something is aware of it. And as soon as it says anything, then it's just the noticer aware that something's aware of it, but it's not the awareness itself. So either something pops, and then it's like, the words are something like, I am the awareness of the noticer. Because what are we talking about? I'm saying, you're the subject. You're the subject. You are aware of this. You are aware of this. You are. So we're talking about you, right? We're talking about you, but not even the noticer. We're talking about you that you can't find, never find. So consciousness is never found. From one word, they brought that word consciousness, you can use any word. But it's never found, and it's never um, <laughs> gotten exactly. Something's realized. Huh. It's never experienced. That's a big one. Consciousness is never experienced. And it's us. Us. It's like Ramana used to call it the I of I. Letter I of letter I. So, okay. There we are. Here we are. So bringing, so if we just close our eyes for a moment again. And bringing attention into the sensation of the body. The breathing allowing energy and attention to just flow into the feeling sense <coughs> of the body and the breathing. And noticing the sounds, the field of sound. The sound of your breathing, the sound of my voice, the sound of the cars, the sounds of the room, the high-pitched sounds and allowing energy and attention to flow into those sounds. To the sensations of the body and all of the energy in the room, all of the sense of presence of all of us here. Attention flowing into that. Attention flowing into all the sounds. Whatever you're seeing, Attention flowing into the visual field, tasting and smelling. Attention flowing into that. Whatever emotions you're feeling, allowing your attention to just merge with the feeling sensations of the emotion. The me sense. Allowing yourself, allowing your attention to merge with the reason. And noticing the thoughts have a weight and an energy of their own, allowing your attention to merge with thoughts. That's it. And if you don't see how to do that, just passively let it happen. Don't worry too much about it. Don't be concerned about the detail. Just allow yourself to merge with your whole experience to be your own experience.
including attention and the noticing. When you're ready, just open your eyes. So. I'm going to talk just a little bit further and then I'm going to open it up so that we just have some conversation. But um, I wanted to make it clear the basis. Because we're going to be talking about ego. And um, I think without touching the basis for me, Talking about ego is um, and the reality of it. It's tricky. I personally, you know, I mean, I mention this only because I know some folks know I'm involved with waking down. And it's like, oh, I want you to know. I mean, my my, you know, my foundational teacher is actually Papaji, who was a disciple of Ramana Maharshi direct disciple of Ramana Maharshi. And my contact with him was very extensive. And so for me, ultimately there is no ego. There is no past, there is no future. And <clears throat> even before I met Papaji, I was very much involved with Tibetan Buddhism, which, uh, and so tantric Buddhism, and I never stopped doing any of my Tibetan practices after the Babaji. I just wasn't doing them in a fashion in which I was seeking. I was doing them some other way. I can't really even say how. Something was continuing to open. And then I got involved with Waking Down. And nothing canceled out anything else. So I'm here to speak as myself. I'm not representing some point of view at all or representing all the points of view that have been useful to me. It's just, that's it. There's no axe to grind here. <laughs> um, the way I, I experience reality, it, it, you know, all of us, how could you put it into words, right? I mean, but just for the sake of talking, when I'm teaching, often I'll talk about there's being, and this is a very standard Buddhist way of talking, three dimensions of reality, that are on a continuum, they're not separate. It's just like talking about steam, talking about water, talking about ice. It's all H2O. <clears throat> One dimension is the space that is our identity that is, in not even space, it's beyond space. All space is happening in it. We are absolutely free there and there is never a moment when we aren't free. It is nothing to do in relation to a realization of it always being the case all the time. And there's nothing that can be said about it, really, other than that kind of stuff. Yeah. You can keep pointing at it, and that's about it. What else is there to do? Nothing. And radiating from that, as soon as you open your mouth, it's like, no, not true, but there's a way in which radiating from it all the time, manifesting as it, is a homogeneous field of energy that becomes many fields of interpenetrating energy. And those fields of interpenetrating energy become more and more dense, and then they appear as multiplicity objects. And in any moment, if we do very much what was happening last time, we, the last uh, presentation, we can just relax into the way in which we are an interpenetrating field of energy. And then the sense of being distinct and contracted and small and in pain unravels. That's having to do with Tantra. Using that actually has to do with both Hindu Tantra and Buddhist Tantra. It's about transformation of the feeling of limits through energy. Recognizing energy. It's really interesting. When I was with Papaji, he was very much, uh, much of the time speaking strict Advaita Vedanta, which 
you know, he, you know, he said he was, if you asked him really, he was like beyond all of that. But people usually interpreted it, interpret it that way. That he was talking strict advice to the doctor. So there's very little talk about energy and transmission, presence. It was, you know, there was little talk about that. But mostly it was what's aware of the energy. If you ask about energy, what's aware of it? So it was pointing to that space. So everybody that I knew that used to go to satsangs and with Papaji, you'd ask them about, you know, when they were in the States, what teachers they were, went to see and all of this. And everybody would agree, like, no, it's not, you know, it's really about what's aware of everything. It's not about any subtle phenomena. But when you checked and you asked them, why did you go to this teacher instead of that one? They said, oh, because the energy is so powerful. <laughs> So this is side effect when attention is on the spaciousness, which is this kind of radiance and this kind of energy that we feel whenever we gather together in anything like this. And it's very, very nurturing. Um, Tantra takes it on directly and mentions it directly and uses that directly. Um, and then the third piece is that we end up being very dense. And frankly, uh, for me, that really helped, uh, waking down actually helped me a lot with that. that. Otherwise, I wouldn't even have been attracted to it. But there was something about the acknowledgement of limits, being in continuity with all of that. So the affirmation of the ego. So in some ways, you know, uh, I'm schooled in all of them, and they all are useful. That's all. I'm just one of them. Full disclosure, that's really where I'm at. So let's see, I have some things. Three things I wanted to talk about. The oh, ego, okay, before we start off, I just want to acknowledge that it really depends on what school to even define what ego is, right? I mean, you know, Freud talked about an ego, and we in the West, we hear the, uh, we hear the explanations in Indian philosophy, we connect up, oh, that's the same, that's the same ego, sometimes without, you know, kind of sloppy ways. But I think it, I think it behooves us to be honest about the fact that we don't, that we don't know exactly what ego is. It's different depending on the circumstance we're talking about. <coughs> and to try to become clear, maybe be using our own terms or making them up as we go along, but at least be acknowledged that we're not always saying the same thing when we say ego. Um, and to try to be a little specific about, oh yeah, this is my experience. Um, one of the things that uh, for me is important is individuality in the sense of this. As consciousness, we are all the same. We're simply aware of, our, of everything that's arising. And the position or what's arising is so unique and distinct. Like, I have no idea what's arising for you right now. I never will. From your side, what you're experiencing is absolutely unique. Even if all of us were able to be in total no mind at once, sitting here, um, that'd still be, you'd still be sitting exactly like Adam. Nobody would be sitting in exactly the same position you are. Nobody. You'd have to actually, you know, be able to become like translucent and walk right into you and see, and see through your eyes. And nobody's doing that. So what you see is absolutely unique. You are seeing a unique Krishna. You are hearing a unique Krishna. Krishna. Even if all of us had silent minds, let alone the fact that we have minds that are interpreting you know, and saying, he's like this, he's not like that, I agree with this, I agree with that, I don't like that, I do like this, and this annoys me, and this is interesting, and blah, blah, blah. all that's going on. That makes us all unique. But even if we were totally quiet, we were in a unique position all the time. And that in itself is a basis for recognizing that each of our students, even if we, even if we don't call that ego, they have something that's unique, that is worth hearing, that each of us is a sealed mystery in our multiplicity. Whether that's ego or not ego, well, we can talk about that. It could, be, it could have ego, it could not have ego. But always, whatever somebody says, is absolutely worth listening to, each and every one of us. Because we don't have any access to it except through that being. And even then, of course, we don't know, we still don't know. But they're doing their best to describe it. 
And it doesn't it feel different when somebody actually treats you that way? You know, what does that happen when you do speak it's like, wow, they're really listening. I really feel like I'm being heard and seen. So is that ego? Oh, I need to have that being seen. Or is that something else? What's going on there? It's worth looking at there. Um, somebody early on, my, my dear, dear friend Hanuman Golden, who gave satsang for years in Portland and in, in, in Seattle, a disciple of Babaji. Um, when I first got involved in Waking Down, I was very much involved in his song, but also. And there was a little bit of a disagreement going on between the volunteers. He said, well, you do that kind of, you know, you're very comfortable with people arguing and having egos and talking to each other. Why don't you see what you can do over there? <laughs> so I sat down with him and I thought, hmm, what would, how would I be able to explain this to them? I said, okay, we're going to sit in a circle and we all know that we're consciousness itself because they were very comfortable with that concept. That was their experience too. I said, so when Laura is going to speak, the only thing we're going to be listening to is what's it like for consciousness itself to become Laura? What's it like for consciousness to be a Laura? And of course, the only one who's an expert on what it's like for consciousness to become, to incarnate as a Laura, is Laura. So that's what we're going to do. So when Laura speaks, whether you agree with her, you disagree with her, you don't, you think, wow, she's crazy, or you think, wow, this is brilliant, whatever. All we're listening for is what's it like to be Laura. And we did it with John, and we did it with Henry. And just doing that creates an entirely different basis. There's no need for disagreement or agreement in that. Okay. I said well, everything I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Is there, if there's anyone who has any comments or anything you'd like to share, or any uh, outrage, outrageous uh, statements of protest? <laughs> and I love that definition of Padma Sambhava. It's all those that have helped us come to this. Yes. And then hearing you chant that, your yeah. whole talk was worth that. One. That was just one. <laughs> Yeah, the chant was amazing, thank you. I mean, I, yeah. I, you probably already are aware, but I was just being in the chant with you and the energy of it, and suddenly mm -hmm. I was aware of teachers from thousands of years ago yeah. in this space, and I was seeing them and feeling yeah. them. It was really amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even Shirley was deep in the <laughs> 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 wow. yeah, she was, It was like, I looked at you and was like, <laughs> wow, that's so good. Cool. Grab the whole thing. Are really you done? I'm like, all right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Sure awesome. <laughs> and now she's relaxed. Yeah, well, and I, I feel like that's part of it. It's like it, like, it that woke up um, the non think. Yes. You know, and then this, the meditation, the guided meditation, was uh, the subject object. The subject never being object, yeah. you know, that, that, that you get to the place where that's not, there's no object to the subject. Yes. No subject. And that it felt wonderful to not have that defined. Yes. And you just kept leaving it. I, I really appreciate it. This last piece, too, of um, consciousness expressing itself uniquely mm -hmm. through each being. Mm -hmm. We all know that. But um, to live our lives from that, um, and, you know, that's the crux of it. Yeah. Yeah, to really um, see each person as their beautiful expression. Mm -hmm. trying to get in there right. and, and interpret their experience. Right. Like so many times we do or you know, it happens to me. You know, try to interpret my experience from their perception. Exactly. Rather and I and I'll say, no, 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 no. 
You know, but they stick with that, their perception of what I've said. Isn't it ironic? Yeah, and I feel totally unheard. Right? And they're trying to get you, they think. And they they're really, it's usually sincere. They're yeah. trying to get no, but that's well, not how it yeah, works. Their intention is very beautiful, yeah. but it's but a way that we up. really miss each other. Yes, miss each other. Yeah. And we would miss each yeah. other. Yes. And we don't even want to. You know, it's not that intention that we want to miss each other, but we do in that moment. We try to interpret it from our perception. Yeah. And just be with them. Yeah. Yeah, people can ask or more if they want, but to just let them be in the space that they are and just hear them. Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually taught that, you know, that that was a good practice, was to uh, try to get inside a person's perception and understanding that point, rather than not do that, right. and just be. Intellectually, right? Shoes. Exactly. You know, uh, we don't need to do that. Yes. We just need to do that. That in itself is deep understanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing. I mean, my experience with this is that as I'm listening, mm -hmm. this, the way when we talk about, you know, like I said, the three things, the way we exist is interpenetrating fields. With nothing to do in terms of, you could say, interfering help then field-wise, it opens up. And I feel myself as them, as they're speaking. And simultaneously, right? That's different, though. That's different. Yeah. And simultaneously, I know I have n no access to them as the divine mystery. I cannot know what it's like to be them. But my listening is the best that can happen. My allowing them to be. And the feeling. Yes. Now this but it's is still our felt sense. Thank you. That's what I was where was this the next place I was going. Absolutely. It's still our felt sense. I mean I've had conversations with folks with me. Well, I can feel people. I can feel them. I can feel what you're feeling, Krishna, they tell me. And I said, yes. And even if you were the most psychic, intuitive ability to feel every single person in the room, and I'm not denying that this is not a city or a power that happens the more we relax into being. But it'll always be from your side. You'll never feel it from my side. And it's like, oh yeah, right. That's a big difference. <laughs> this is, or not. We don't know. Huh? <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. Or maybe not a big difference. <laughs> Yeah, we don't well, know that. We don't know, <laughs> right. know. Exactly. But the but the distinction is between yeah. saying yeah. Um, it's something like um, our inherent dignity. Yeah. You know that that because there is something a little. I know. I'm sure many of us have been around the block. So you may have, and if you haven't, you probably have the pleasure of meeting someone like this in the future. Um, where they are very intuitive and you just feel a little creeped out by it. Like they're telling you what you're feeling and you're like, hey, hey, you know, I, I begin here and you begin there. Can you please not do that? Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting because in field reality there is no place we begin and no place we end. But there is a distinction in terms of in the realm mm -hmm. of multiplicity and objects, boundaries are appropriate. They're very useful. Yeah. And they actually lead, no, not they don't lead, but they allow the other in a very paradoxical way. There you go. They enable us to have this conversation. They allow us to have this conversation. Right. Yeah. Well, they allow, allow the other. So there's a man in the back with his hand up. Yeah, you know, I just appreciate your orienting us to the person, <coughs> to the manifest. And um, not only does the form, it, the form also reveals. <coughs> as well as in, you know, allows us to see it in others. 
So I really appreciate your integrating personal and the form with a non-dualist perspective, which for me is uncommon. And I'm curious, uh, is your orientation, which I affirm implicitly, is that something that you're bringing forth in the sense of, for lack of a better word, or I don't want to say revelation, but a, a further evolution, or is it something also inherent in what Papa James was teaching? So I'm curious whether it's... Do <laughs> you have to ask such a politically charged question? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 whether this is a contribution which the West is making I, in oh, evolution right. of the West. I think this is very good. This is a very good question. Um, and I'll try not to, to get too heady. As I can see, I know I can go there. Um, I, I, I do see precedence of it, in, particularly in Hindu Tantra. Particularly in Hindu Tantra, even more so than in Buddhist Tantra. There's an affirmation of ego in Hindu Tantra that's non dual Tantra, like Kashmir Shaivism, Trika. That is unprecedented in India. Absolutely unprecedented. It's amazing. It's really, and it is a later development, probably. So that might be why. I honestly don't think, now here's a weird way of talking. I actually, yes, it is an evolution, and yes, it is in continuity. It isn't exactly what Papaji was teaching. It's totally inherent or based in what Papaji was teaching. We find ourselves in the same position that all the traditions of non-duality have been in, where Buddha says something and then the Mahayana says, oh, everything we're saying is exactly what Buddha said, and you know, you go, eh, really? Uh, okay. That's not an it's not an evolution exactly, it's something that he secretly taught. <laughs> Same thing with the Tibetan Tantras, you know, it's a continuity. Um, I, a weird thing is that there, I, I actually um, feel that, in particular, the Tantric traditions in India, the Hindu Tantra, we're addressing exactly, how do you say it? In the unmanifest, there's no distinction. There's no difference, really. So the closest you, closer you get to consciousness, to the formless, when you speak about this, the more eternal it is. But in manifestation, there have been developments in terms of even I, human identity. So, People who know world culture, I mean, you, a, lot of, a lot of us experience this. And you could even, uh, you know, when I grew up, and it might be different. I mean, everything is in motion now, so it might not even be true anymore. When I grew up, there was huge difference between the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. And when I went to India in 1992, um, I noticed there were questions that were not asked, especially outside of the cities in India, but even in the cities, that I was asked routinely as a child. So, well, this is perfect, because it is really about ego. As a child, I was often asked, when I was like five, four years old, five years old, six years old, in the, in the barber shop, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> this was never asked to a child who was four or five in India. And if you think maybe, then go back a hundred years, it was never asked. Why? Because, you know, as a four year old, five year old, what happened to me? It's like, who am I? going to be when I grow up. Wow, I have choice, there's a future, there's a me that decides, all this stuff, wow, okay. I'm going to be different than I am. I'm going to be different than I am, I'm going to become something, and it's my choice. I'm being asked, even at four. It's like, it's okay for you to dream about being something else, to be, about being something, as a boy. Now I guess it was different with women, and this is all part of what I'm speaking about. That the sense of individuated ego, in the way we mean it now, which goes back to what I was saying in terms of what does ego mean? We take an ancient word and we can cobble it together with Freud and we got what we talk about in the West. The sense of an individuated ego, the sense of an individuated person, was a gradual attainment, a gradual evolution that didn't exist in the form it exists now in the past. Even in, in the West. But in the West, it had some precedence. People who were individuals who said, I'm not a Jew, and were in a Jewish situation, they were outcast just 600 years ago. They were not part of the tribe. Sorry, you're not, you know. Or a Christian. I'm not a Christian anymore. You might get killed. 
I mean, tribal, ethnic sense of who you are is who you are in India. That's still often that. Who am I? Depends what womb I came out of. I can tell you who I am. I came out of a cobbler's woman, woman's womb. So I'm a cobbler. That's it. I mean, here we are. Um, I'm from this tribe. This is who I am. This distinction shifted over time in the West. So the point now where you have people say, oh, I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm this, I'm that. I decide who I am. Very new sensibility. When I say very new, maybe a thousand years old. Or even, it's a gradual thing. In the past, people who did this were exiled and killed. And that mutation was wiped out as much as possible. And then the mutation kept happening, 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 until the, mutation, the mutants got together and said, let's, let's form a guild through these people. I'm going to do what we want. And they became innovators, powerful people. And it's still, it's not all done. It's on a continuity. There are places in the world where there aren't many individual people. So then they say, let's have a democracy. And then everybody votes according to their tribe. And you go, what happened? All they needed was democracy. In our place it works, and we're all individuated people. So if you want to, you know, there, there are people who talk about it. There are places in the West, including the United States, where that's still on. Exactly. Still yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, I would say it's, it's ubiquitous. It yeah. is. So it's all on a continuum. So it's not done. And it's a spectrum. This is what I'm doing by speaking this way, is I'm validating the new mutants mm -hmm. to be part of the tantric tradition. So in the past, it was like, well, ego was just kind of a, a tendency to be out of alignment with the tribe, so let's just get rid of it. It's, not, it's in the way. I mean, in many spiritual cultures, it's sort of like that, right? But what we're saying is that, no, it's not just in the way. In the tantric cultures in particular said, no, it's not just in the way, it's fine. The Hindu Tantra really goes, I tell you, Trika is the only one, even beyond, I mean, in a way, it has language that's very different than any of the other Indian traditions. Because what it claims is that the ego, your ego, all that's wrong with it is it's too small. That's all that's wrong with it. That if you remove the sense, the, the I amness gets contracted around a small sense of yourself. And that, now this is different than the space of consciousness. Now we're in the realm of interdependent fields and contracted and expanded fields, right? The way in which we contract and the way in which we expand, we contract and expand in the field of con in the space of consciousness. In the space of consciousness, there's no change, right? But ego is happening in the field, and in that field, from uh, a tricker point of view, th there's a limitation of your sense of I amness. And that sense of I amness is what ego is when it's limited. And then as the sense of limitation there ends, you become larger and ironically more humble. Strangely. You would never think that's the case because we usually mean by big ego is a small ego that wants to assert its control. So there's this contracted sense that says you, 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 stay put because it feels small. You know, so you got a little Napoleon doing all this stuff, right? This is different. This is expansion of the sense of individuality so that it includes other in this, and then, you know, in, you know, in Waking Down, we talk about this in terms of mutuality. When you listen to others and you're able to feel them as yourself without subsuming their dignity as a unique person. So you're opening, but you're acknowledging the mystery of the other as you open. This is more akin to the Bodhisattva, so it's really been worked out more in Mahayana and then in, in the Vajrayana in terms of the opening of the sense of the self to include more and more. So that's an expansion of the ego. And the trika, they say that God has the ultimate ego, and that's his consort, the goddess. The sense of I amness is God's personhood or his ego. And it's not separate. This God we're speaking about, Shiva, is not separate from any of us. So it's not like a big guy on a throne we have to be afraid of because he has this big ego. But he has an ego in which he is all of these beings. So that every being that is suffering is him who is suffering. So he doesn't get away with any of his. It's, like he's like, it's, it's all his will, but he doesn't get away with anything because every single creature that is suffering, according to his will, is him.
in suffering or hurt, suffering, because it can be, you can say, God says just as easily. It can go either way. But the sense of I amness is expansive. So the sense of ego is expansive for the yogi or yogini. It's about at the, at the level of the fields, at the level of the person, it's about becoming more and more acclimated to being a larger sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. This really goes uh, very much along with what uh, Sonia yesterday. Sonia, is that the right place? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I was, I was going to acknowledge that, thank you, I love hearing it about this from this perspective because it maps in a different way my experience of the freedom. Exactly. The freedom of just being, and I never thought of it as that expanding expanding in the way you described it that was fabulous Thank so this is and this is a marriage this is yes it's a revelation okay i'll claim it as my revelation everybody's got a revelation this is how i feel every one of us is unique and the way in which you learn things and the order in which they came to you even the order in which everyone has common teachers but they are unique to you because the order and the way you heard them only you heard them that way so all of us are in relationship to being that way. We are uniquely receiving revelation and really it's a great pot latch we have where we can all just become. <laughs> yeah. I recently came across a, a very interesting um, teasing out of, of what the term manifestation refers to. Yeah, I think it's directly relevant to this notion of new revelation or you know, ego developing and so forth. And because we so often talk about the unmanifest manifesting as the world, manifesting as this, as that. And what I came across was the manifestation refers to the way in which being differentiates itself, distinguishes itself, and articulates itself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is this is. Thank you. I mean, what this is all part of one piece. And I really I want to honor something that I came into late in my own spiritual development is Trika Kashmir Shaivism because I really feel that it actually articulates a lot of this. It's more. It's like an unpacking of yes. being. Yes. Right. Exactly. And even now this now waking down frankly, actually got me on the track where I could appreciate truth. So it's all, everything just unfolds in the order that you need it to. And what, you know, and now I'm actually getting more into listen, reading Ibn Arabi as well, which is, you know, Sufism, because it, there's a lot in there as well, in terms of unique revelation. You know, uh, in terms of speaking about how God is in relationship to us, the way he's in relationship to every prophet, for individual revelation. So he's a Muslim, right? Ibn Arabi, he's a Sufi. Um, when did he live? Uh, the 1400s. Yeah. And, and you know, as any, as any Sufi or Muslim would tell you, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, right? He's the last prophet. But see, you read the, the, the fine print for, for these particular Sufis anyway, for this particular point of view. And he said, you know, the evolution of mankind needed laws for all the tribal peoples, all the nations of the planet. And they started with certain prophets like Moses or this or that, but you know, many unknown people that gave people laws that apply to everybody. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, you know, don't lie, all of that. And the last one to do that was Muhammad. It was done. And basically he said, we reached a saturation point. There's no need for any of the prophets uh, who have a relationship with God to tell other people what to do because everybody knows. We got it, you know, even whether, whether you're connected, you don't know anything about God, you do know about God, whatever, you know it's not right to kill. And that's out now, that's done, that's finished, so that's sealed. However, the relationship that each prophet had with God is available to every friend of God always. And your own personal revelation, that is that relationship between you and being, in which things are revealed to you, that continues for everyone. And that is what our life is about more and more of the relationship to our unique relationship to God. Our unique, you know, and he calls it your unique angel or your unique message that you re receive. And then for him, he says, mm -hmm. all the Christians are all paying, praying to a different Jesus because they see Jesus uniquely, each one of them. Every month praying to a different Allah because they see 
it differently, uniquely, and yet it's all one. It's this divine mystery in which multiplicity reveals multiplicity. Nobody is going to know being in the way that you do. Nobody. I mean, in terms of the unmanifest, yeah, but you don't even know that. You just are that. Right? So there we all abide in God, as God, but without any language for it. Well, it gives such joy to our conditioning. Yes. Because our conditioning is how we come into our revolution. It is. And, then, and, that, and that conditioning unravels and unfolds, so there's more to be revealed. It becomes more expansive, more whole, and it becomes closer and closer to the unconditioned, more and more transparent, more and more, I guess, translucent. And, and, and I think Peter's words are, what is it? Uh, there's an in-between mind, right? Uh, radiant. 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 radiant mind. There it is. It becomes more and more radiant. It becomes more and more transparent to to the transcendent. The the there it is. I always think of it as like a portal. That the ego is a portal. And the better you are at having really good boundaries around the ego, then the more yes. presence just comes through. There it is. So there it is. So yeah, the, the piece about your your gift, you know, giving your gifts and really being into so what this means is that at some level, paying attention to what we feel what it is that we feel and, and 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 it's like my experience of it is is that it's allowing yourself to pay attention to what you're feeling and to validate your what you're feeling is it isn't a straight path in the sense of, it's more it's more like um, how the river our river goes down a mountain than a canal it's like, you know, if you were an engineer and you went to the top of a mountain, you said, we got a water source, we have this glacier, we need the village down there, has to have the water, we'll just run some concrete right down this thing, this mama, just and bulldoze all those rocks, and, just, and then it'll get that. It's not like that. I mean, I wish it was, but it's not. It's like, and of course, he, the wishing of it is, you know, God knows best. Um, basically, it's more like, the glacier moves around the rock, and it moves from here, and it wanders, and it meanders, and eventually it gets down to the bottom. And then, as that flow happens, it wears, you know, it wears away the bed, the riverbed, so that it becomes wider and more expansive. So it actually changes the river, the, the mountain, but not the way that a canal does. It does it naturally, just through the flow. So the more that we pay attention to our impulses, you can say, the impulses of being, to the field, to, and that means being open to input, too. What does it feel like when I say this and the person goes, <gasps> okay, what does that feel like in there? Not, oh, well, screw them, but like, no, I'm also this, mm -hmm. and they went like that, oh, okay. Um, but maybe she's wrong, maybe it's okay to do that. Maybe that, all that just is like, doesn't matter, this is how she is, this is how I am. So then, it, it shifts, it changes, you, 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 and this is true with everybody. You just be open to the field of everybody, mm. and, but not losing touch with your own sense of who you are and what you need to do. And you keep paying attention to that, and the more you pay attention to that, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. <laughs> and then you manifest more and more. What you may manifest is simply walking the dog. That's the thing, it isn't about the usual thing of, you know, Tony Robbins, go for it, get it, be somebody. It's not that. It could be that. It could be that. Now, some of us go, I don't want it to be that because that's too much. I'll be in the spotlight. And then that's, that's surrender because it might be that. And some of us go, I want it to be that, but it isn't actually going to be that. And that's surrender. So we don't know. We're being lived in some one thing that's coming to me more and more is that it's absolutely okay to say, I'm teaching for myself. Yes. I mean, at the point that we're at, we know that that's, that's really our highest offering. Yes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Because yeah. <laughs> we also know that it's never for, only for, I mean, right. it's for ourselves. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and see, this is the thing, to, 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 to move forward without fear. Um, about about ego, about um, about selfishness, about pride, doesn't exempt us from the results of ego, of pride, whatever. So 
you will get purified. In other words, if you, we're all assholes at some level. And so whatever we do, you too. <laughs> so whatever we do, that's, it's like brackish water, you know, when you turn on the water in some houses, you know, you get brown water for a while. The only way to get it clear is to let it be brown for a while. And then it gets clear. So it can be a painful process to go through moving forward with undue expectation and desires and all of that. And we try as spiritual folks often, I mean, I'm speaking from experience, it's like, often it's just like, if I could just avoid that because, you know, I want to be really transcendental, I don't want to be selfish, if I could just avoid it. But what am I really trying to say? God, don't chastise me, or life, don't show me in the mirror of reality, ego that I have. I'd like to just, like, if I could, in secret, personally, just clean it up before I go out, then I won't have to go through the difficulty of feeling what it's like to know I just did it in front of a bunch of people. So, you know, that real, what is real humility? Real humility is actually real arrogance exposed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's something that I keep coming back to, and I don't know if it was needed to be said, but the, pra the, the example that you gave about when in conflict within a group that you're basically um, perceiving the consciousness of the other. Or conceiving, it's basically just letting the person be exactly as they are without, without having to agree or disagree. Like, you yeah, will... I wasn't asking a question. Okay. I wanted to finish what yeah. I was saying. Yeah. There, there's a... Um, that it's very different to perceive somebody's... Uh, the other's consciousness than walking a mile in their shoes or perceiving their feelings that you're talking about or sensing and having a boundary to have this thing. It, it's like in particularly used with conflict it gets out of that level of identification with the other and feeling whatever they're feeling and knowing or thinking that you know whatever their position is. Right. So there's something about making that leap to see the other as the whole consciousness, like that the, there's a larger consciousness. That that's a great exercise on the one hand and not to get caught up in my being, in my own big consciousness. You know, it's like if I'm going to put my energy anywhere, it's like find the picky little asshole that I am keeps me humble enough to see the other one's largeness. Well, yes. That I just, I want to caution that though, because it's, because it's so, you know, it's just, and, and it may not be what you're saying, so I might be getting misunderstanding, right. mm -hmm. but, um, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that because it, for me it's a matter of holding, and when I say holding, I don't mean holding like this. I mean like this. Okay, mm -hmm. my own judgments. Mm -hmm. It's just being with them. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's speaking, it's just that I'm letting them be who they are. They are who they are, mm -hmm. and when they speak, I'm. Going to have judge. It's going to be judgments. This, but I don't have to become like them. They don't have to become like me. Um, and um, I don't have to agree with them. They don't have to agree with me. I'm simply listening to them as they are. And that is the way in which I listen to what it's like for consciousness to be a Susan. Because Susan is by being who she is. I'm hearing what it's like for consciousness to be a Susan. I'm not even asking her to, to, to identify as consciousness. I'm just saying, who, what do you want to say, Susan? And whatever she's saying, I'm simply hearing, what this is what it's like to be Susan, right. period. Nothing, nothing else. And inside, I have all kinds of like, she's crazy. That's not what happened. This is going on. That's going on. And I'm simply holding that or being with that. But I'm not relating to her through that. That's. I, I got that. I mean, that's like deep listening and, and being in, a, in unconditioned awareness and perceiving the other. But there's something for me tagging it that when I'm in conflict, I don't see the others 
subjectively, yeah. subjectlessness, you know, the largeness of it, and that that somehow cuts me through the story. Like, I don't want to identify with the other person's story, because then I get all involved. It's like, if I'm not right. seeing, I'm seeing the... So this is really, in a way, you could say that, and, and, and this is being able to see others as, without it becoming a conceptual idea, like, oh, they are divine, the way to do that is to be in touch with your own sense of spaciousness. Mm -hmm. So you just, you just are the space, you know, so this is a simultaneous, I sometimes have an exercise with folks where I have them gaze for a little while and then become aware of peripheral vision. In other words, like, what's on, what's on the edges of this and what's there. And so this is an easy way for us to get out of being simply what is um, content to what is aware of the content. Mm -hmm. And then let's have a conversation and make sure it's actually about our stuff. <laughs> so that you're simultaneously aware of the spaciousness, mm -hmm. but it's your own, because they're your own and their being is the same, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. See, a lot of a lot of this is. Um, I mean, I've just added in. You know, I can't, I can't say that that is what every teacher in Waking Down is doing. But when they, but the thing of mutuality, this idea of mutuality, that's the, that's what that buzzword is about. It's about recognizing that the only way in which we can really be together um, is to acknowledge that the other is a mystery and is inherently divine. So we, you know, unless they ask us to get in there and muck up, there's. There is a, a great power in not doing so. I know I coined a little phrase. I'm not sure it's the same, but it feels the same to me. Is that I, I call it like the inner Leatherman tool, mm -hmm. and is that no matter what anyone presents or I present anymore, just period, no matter what, they will not be out of my heart, and that includes me. Mm -hmm. It allows what you just said seems to happen by just having that presence available. It doesn't feel special either. It feels that's why I call it a Leatherman tool. It's just useful in all situations. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. So, um, something that kind of dovetails with this, that is going again with Ego and a little bit with, I wanted to complete with Sonia and, sir, what's your name? Michael. Michael. Um, is that, <clears throat> for me, the distinction or what is further, and Waking Down has a piece of this, and my connection of it in a, an integral sense or in the sense of Kashmir Shaivism is, is just what occurred to me. So and we're all in this place of speaking unique revelations. Um, the unpacking piece, and this also goes with what you're saying, like the unpacking piece is the last piece that get, got unpacked recently, is the individuated ego. And so the validation of the individuated ego, the individuated self, as simply being a manifestation of that <clears throat> is particularly tantric and is tricka of all because tricka is emphatic on saying that, um, taking the position that all manifestation is real. So, and then you say, well, what about the ego? They say, real too. Well, how could it be? Well, you know, to use modern language, it's real as software. Just because it's not real as hardware doesn't mean it's not real as software. It's like, well, it's just concepts strung together, strung together. I can see through it. Yeah, well, that's what computer, your, your operating system is just ones and zeros strung together. You try operating your computer with that one. It doesn't mean that it isn't a thing. So I like to say, you know, um, being you, is the uh, with a thinking mind and an ego and a forward and backward and a global positioning system and a, and a being in Oregon and being in Portland on Sunday at 1220 is the way that consciousness comes into manifestation. It's not an accident. It's not as though like ignorance is something like you know we're battling against or that consciousness did oh what a mistake it manifested all this stuff and created confusion. At the end, confusion is like, that's totally not non-dual when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, you know, I try to get around the language because people think non-duality means there is no two. Mm. No, the word non-dual has the word two in it. It's, it's not just two. It's non-dual or it's beyond just two-ness. 
sometimes I say that what I'm talking about is the unity of duality and non-duality. That's, that's really non-duality, but it's non-duality of duality and non-duality. Really and that's really what tricka is, uh, Kashmir Shaivism. Because mm -hmm. it acknowledges that the way that certain manifestation happens, the way that certain things happen, is through a sense of separateness. Mm -hmm. So the sense of separateness was potential in consciousness itself, and it got impacted just like form did. So there's a way in which you're not the body. You could say that. Well, I'm not the body. I'm not this body. Okay, good. But you know, we know that there's the ways in which that we are, and it's useful in terms of being embodied, in terms of being a whole human being, to be embodied. And it's the same thing with the sense of separateness. Sense of separateness. No, that's not me. I can, if I go to field reality, it disappears. Well, yeah, that's true. But do you always go to field reality? No, oh, God damn it, I'm working on that. <laughs> well, it's good to have the skill, the flexibility to go in between states. It's really important. It's, we do each other a service to remind each other that we can go in and out. But the affirmation that different states are all that, are all that. Krishna. Yes. Right now, I'm a separate distinct entity with uh, a compelling mystery that has to be expressed. Right here. It's right here in, in my physical being. But what it is, is the same thing as that glass ceiling that you're talking about. It's, it's the same silence. It's, silence. It's, it's the thing that we can't name, but the closest I can come to it is silence. And and it's the thing that lives, that, that seems to live in all of us, at the same time all this other stuff that's going on, you know. And it manifests in a specific place, in a specific person, and demands to be spoken. It's really a mystery, it's really odd. <laughs> it's just odd. <laughs> it is weird, it's not, it is a weird thing. Yeah. Oh, that was so cute. Thank you so much. Thank you. something like a difficulty. It's a hero's journey uh, at the level of the manifest being. Mm -hmm. It isn't always easy. Sometimes we feel lost, we feel confused, we're between um, plateaus, we're between, you know, I guess the, the Buddhists, they, or the Tibetans, they have this teaching called Bardo, means intermediate or in-between state, and it's between births. And it can be very, very confusing. Some people train their whole lives to, to lessen the confusion in the bardo. And I, my feeling is that this is, this is really what, I mean, this is identical to death. It's the out-of-controlness. It's when we're in-between states, and then we know that we're actually being, li <coughs> being lived. We don't always know that, but that's actually the safest. Like, oh, it's a process that's happening. I'm being lived. And the I that feels like it's being lived is along for the ride and surrenders to the I that's doing the living, which is... Which is the big I. Big I. They say, really who I am? But see, that word really mm -hmm. makes it sound like the I that's on for the ride is not who I am. <laughs> and this, this is the weirdest thing, talk about coming full circle, is that sometimes... When I think about this, um, the archetype of the Lord Jesus Christ comes into mind. Mm -hmm. yes. Servant mm -hmm. in relationship. To, I mean, sometimes his relationship to God the Father is played down. It's all throughout. It. It's all he was about. If he was here, he was talking about him, God, 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 God. Somehow that doesn't. His relationship, he was a servant. 
and he manifested, and that's why he was the son of God, he manifested that one through service with great amount of suffering. Yeah? Garden of Gethsemane, tears, feeling abandoned by that one, saying he felt abandoned by He didn't use any expli expletives. You know, it's like, why did you forsake me? You know, what happened? Where are you? And it's like, okay, I get it. I'm going to have to be killed, but could you please, if you could please do something about it? You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, and this is supposed to be the big guy, right? Like, and he's in the he's sweat, he's sweating great drops. Now, whether ever, any of that happened historically or not, it's just so irrelevant to me. It's just, there's no bearing whatsoever. It's, it's the archetype of it. It's the, the metaphor of it, which I'm, which I'm so in love with. That, you know, we are, and you know, one could say that's the Bodhisattva. Right? That we are that. We are divine, we are human, it's a crucifix, it's hard, it's not easy to be here, it's a wound, um, and there is wellness in it, deep, deep, deep wellness in it, deep rest in it, um, but, you know, this is, it's nice, I mean, because this is about community, right, so it's good to be able to speak about these qualities of it, mm. so that we can have support there, as egos, without any shame about that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really important for us to have Sangha as awakened beings. Because I, I think this is a notion is like an awakened being doesn't need Sangha. No, the awakened <laughs> being is in Sangha. We are in Sangha. We need each other. So. And the example that you give that this is the most important part of the language including is that Gethsemane moment is that that the Sangha, he has to walk away from the people to face his doubt and the place that says, could you just, could I get out of this one? You know, do I have to? And can you give me guarantee? And, oh, no guarantee. And you can get out of it, but you get to choose. And it's the, then you go back into it. You know, it's like I have to take myself out to come to terms with what I'm going to surrender to with doubt and take the doubt and do it anyway, alone and together, Absolutely. and surrender all of it. And even in the last minute, say, well, why have you forsaken me? It's the last moment. It wasn't like, hey, I got it. Everybody, no problem. <laughs> that's why it's like, okay, that's why it endures, because it's like, Right. What? Right. It's not. It's it ain't not, over, baby. Right. It's, <laughs> and it's not okay. See, this is the, that's, the, that's the piece. You too. won't be happy. It's right. heaven. It's it gold. It's all that's You long. don't know. You know. You don't. You don't know. And this. And I love the. And I love what you said about alone too. That yeah. is really true in a way. You know. Okay. So sangha is really important. And I say it's because sometimes we have to do this alone. So when you go away, you're in the pain, and when you can be in Sangha, then be in Sangha. But there's a certain degree of it that no one, we're the alone with the alone. No one can go there with you. Nobody can be there with you because you're a unique being. Christian Marie used to stand up in front of audiences, and he would just look at everybody, and he would say, together, alone. And then he wouldn't stop. He did it by 10 or 15 minutes. Together, alone. Together. Oh, it's mm -hmm. such a trip. Mm -hmm. And he just wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. you know? But it's like I want to die in a really good way. I mean I had a heart attack in July. Mm -hmm. Right? And so yeah. And I want to die in a really good way. I want to be surrounded by loved ones. I want to be thinking of uh, not even thinking, just in Radiance of being, relaxing, and all that. <laughs> I might be killed by a truck on the way over there and surrounded by strangers and in pain, screaming in the last moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the truth. Okay. So, gotta go. So, that's, you know, to be, to, be, to be real about that, to be sober about that, that that's also, if I am, that's also it. But it's not going to be me going, oh, this is also, it is, it's okay. It's going to be me going, god damn it, Vivian's not here. Oh. <laughs> and that's what is. 
and that, that, you know, in a sense, that's okay. But, I mean, it isn't really okay, too. I mean, it's not okay that the Holocaust happened. It's not okay exactly. that children become, you know, are, can be raped. Oh, yeah. There's a certain degree to which it'll never be okay, either, because we live in a universe where children can be raped. That won't change, even if the reform program goes out and everybody changes. It's, we still live in a university, a universe of possible horror. And letting ourselves just feel that, be with that, not embrace it, and not having it be glossed. Because the horror is often natural disaster. It's not only human. Exactly. Always. It's not our preference. Like I had food poisoning in, like a month or two ago, and in the middle of the night I fell on the ground. And uh, my husband comes in. I'm sitting. I can't sit on the toilet. I have to lean into him, and I can feel like everything's closing in. And I, I looked at him and I said, I'm so sorry. I feel like I could die like this, and it, it's just not how I edit. <laughs> there you go. I'm sorry to leave you with, leave you with this. And like, yeah. <laughs> so, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so I like to. That, that's. I like to end with this. Well, I'm going to end reading this again, but right before that, I'll, I'll, this image of Kuan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, Kanon. Chinrizi, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, was um, male and female, really wonderful image. Mm -hmm. um, I, I heard once that she always has, she has two primary faces, and they're facing in two directions. One face is turned towards vast emptiness, and is in absolute peace. The other face is turned toward all sentient beings, and that face is weeping 24-7, always. This is called the attainment of one's own awareness. I venerate the Supreme Shiva located in the self, who can be known only in self-experience who is devoid of the mental torment of fixation on any specific doctrine. I bow to the benevolent one, the destroyer of the flood of conceptual constructs, free of the snare of the mind's imaginings, transcending even the level of the highest bliss. The method of attaining the goal is to be constantly awake to one's own awareness. By this means that the sage achieves the state free of differentiation. There is no method other than staying with the awareness of one's own being. Closely maintaining awareness of this alone, the yogi and the yogini will become joyful, resting in the self. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.